morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone who's hearing us. I don't know what time is there and which part of the world you are from. Uh, but our next session today is going to be on UK European update during COVID, pre-Brexit, and the future of tourism in 2021. I know us are trying to gable and trying to figure out how and what the market is going to be. We are trying to look at our crystal balls and find out what's happening. But today, uh, we are going to have some experts talk about what they think with their experience and what they think where the world is going to go and how tourism is going to go ahead. I just want to mention to all of you that the more we discuss things, the more we talk about it, uh, the more ideas come out, the new concepts come out, that leads to some good results. I have seen people pick up one idea from somewhere, it germinates into somebody else's mind and third person gets it. And that's what basically is happening. And that's what we also want to go to try that we need some good solutions. So I'm not saying that this is a perfect solution, but we, that's what we are over here going to be trying. So I'm going to, what is going to do is, uh, I'm not going to stand between all of you and, and the speakers and the experts today. So before I hand over uh, the whole floor to uh, Alison Cryer, uh, let me mention to you, she's the founder uh, and managing director of Representation Plus. If you're in Europe and if in, in, in London and other places, uh, I would be surprised if there's somebody who doesn't know her. Uh, put, it, put it that way. Alison, is, she's a lady. Uh, she is a leader. She is a leader in travel, tourism, and hospitality. She launched the Thon Hotel Group before she started her uh, representative uh, representation plus. One thing I must tell her, tell you about her, that she hasn't stopped since. She continuously innovates. Uh, she continues to do a lot of things. And even in this COVID, uh, where everywhere the world was a standstill, uh, she launched what I call, what she calls is easy uh, virtual event. Uh, that's what she recently did. So hats off to you, uh, uh, Alison, when you do all this kind of situation, how you do this magic, I don't know. I'll leave it totally to you. But I'm not going to now stand between you. It's over to you to introduce your experts and take this forward. Pleasure thank to have you. And Alison, over to you. Thank you very much, Sanjeet. And um, thank you very much for those very kind words. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, we are actually in the UK at the moment, all four, all four of us. So um, it is, in fact, good afternoon. Um, but obviously, good morning and good evening to those of you that are in different parts of the world. Um, we're all very honoured and delighted to have been asked by um, the Golf Travel Show to participate in today's session and to give you some insights into what is going on in the, the European and UK world of travel and tourism. I have a very distinguished panel with me, and I'm just going to go around the panel first, ask them to um, say who they are, what their background is, and what their companies do. And then we'll go back to um, each panelist to talk about the, the market itself. So first of all, Tom, would you like to um, introduce yourself? Tom Jenkins. Well, indeed, um, how do you do? Um, my name is, uh, as just said, it's Tom Jenkins. I'm the CEO of ETOA. Uh, we were founded very much as a tour operators association, and the tour operators um, in that association were the ones that sold Europe as a destination throughout the world. Um, since we were founded, and I've been here um, 20 years, I fear, um, the, we've evolved very much into uh, something which represents really every intermediary or any intermediary that sells Europe. So we have both wholesalers, OTAs, online distributors. The one thing in common is that they sell Europe as a destination. And we also have a number of suppliers who, who wish to network. That's effectively uh, what my association is. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And um, Peter, Peter Dickel. Hello, everybody. And thank, thank you for asking me to be here today. I'm delighted to do so. Um, my name is Peter Ducker, and I'm the chief executive of the Institute of Hospitality, which is the professional body for people who are managers and leaders in hospitality. And also we're an educational charity working with universities and hotel schools around the world. Our members work in over 100 countries of the world and they're in every aspect of hospitality. So we have a, a significant percentages, obviously, are obviously hoteliers, but we have restaurateurs, we have people working in food service in every sector of, of, of the industry. Um, and I think what I bring to, to, to this conversation today is experiences that I'm learning, A, from our members in, in, in the Gulf region, but, but also from people in other parts, from members in other parts of the world, which are emerging from COVID at different times. And uh, so we're seeing what's happening. Thank you. And um, last but definitely not least, Simon, Simon McNamara. 
Good afternoon, uh, Alison. Good, good afternoon. Good evening. Good morning, everyone. Um, yes, my name is Simon McNamara, and I'm the UK and Ireland uh, area manager for IATA, the International Air Transport Association, which uh, is a global airline trade body representing over 290 airlines around the world, um, but also uh, a, 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 has a large number of accredited travel agencies as well. So the you know the uh, travel community is very close to our heart as well, despite being an airline trade body. So. Um, we're actively involved not only in the travel and tourism area, but also in in the in the government affairs and advocacy side towards governments, both internationally at a European level um, and at national level. Thank you, thank you. So, um, just to set the scene a little bit, Euromonitor really got, um, gave us some statistics this uh, this week about inbound um, worldwide inbound travel arrivals, and these are um, down fifty seven percent year on year at the moment. They've also predicted that it will take three to five years, depending on the sector, for the industry to return to 2019 um, levels. And they're saying that one of the things that's coming out at the moment from COVID is that 46% of the um, consumers that they research said that there is a permanent shift for them um, in the attention of, towards brands and how brands treat people. So there's some quite important things that have come up out in the last nine months. Um, and so I'm going to hand over to Tom, first of all, to tell us what his thoughts are on the UK, European markets and any other markets that he would like to, to touch upon. Tom, thank um, you. Well, uh, thank you, Alison. Uh, <laughs> thank you for letting me lead off. I think the, the first thing to note, and it's obvious, is that um, those statistics actually hide um, a really catastrophic decline in leisure tourism, which has occurred throughout the world. Um, I don't think there are many of my members that are beating 95% a reduction in business this year. There are a few, but in broad terms, uh, that's what it's looking like. There are very few hotels out there in the principal destinations of Europe that are, are posting better than a 30, 25 to 30% occupancy rate. So the scale of the decline that we're, we've been witnessing is has been absolutely unprecedented. Um, I think the, 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 there, are, there are certain things to note about such a decline. I think firstly, and this is the most obvious point, is that there is always a recovery from something like this. Um, you, you, you're, this is not simply non-sustainable in commercial terms. It's not sustainable in terms of what people want to do. And all the evidence that we have from the origin markets is that whilst there are you know, changes in consumer behavior that people are predicting, some are just projecting onto consumers. One thing is, uh, one thing I'm getting from everybody is that there's a real need, desire to get back to travel. Um, and um, we, we, we hear that really from every origin market from China through to North America, and indeed within the UK and in Europe. Um, I think the other thing to note is that a lot of this, uh, if we're specifically looking at 2021, is driven by the fact that there are a lot of credits out there. Uh, people were not allowed to travel in 2020, and nor did they receive a refund. Uh, what they've received is a, 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 a credit for a booking uh, to take place in 2021. So a lot of the tour operators with, with product in Europe um, are, are sitting there with bookings for next year. They may be perforce transferred from 2020, but we've got a lot of volume sitting there from 2020 carried into 2021. And as I said, there's latent demand. Um, the second thing to note is that um, what people such as my members do is sell the service economy of a destination. Uh, it's seldom remarked, but what we do is we sell the experience people are gonna have when they travel to somewhere. And the experience that they have when they travel somewhere is the, the shops, the hotels, the restaurants, the theatres, the things that people enjoy doing. And at the moment, we don't know what that is going to look like. Um, a lot of these people have suffered very badly over the last six months. And so there's an open question as to what the quality of that experience is. I think it's going to be good. I think it's going to be a unique experience, but it may not be anything like the experience they had in 2019. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. And um, talking of experiences and products, I'll, I'll move on to, to Peter to talk to us a little bit more about his um, hospitality industry. Well, uh, 
Oh, I totally agree with everything Tom was saying, and I see I see that reflected in the hotel sector of it, of our, of our membership. Um, but I think what has surprised everybody is how quickly some markets have bounced back. And when countries have come out of lockdown, they've seen a, a, an incredibly unprecedented demand from markets that felt comfortable with them. So it was typically a local market. People were traveling no more than two or three hours from their homes to stay in a hotel and go and experience, but they just wanted to get out and do something and, and be somewhere different. Um, and I, I, we had a call with our members this morning um, and I was hearing exactly the same thing again as, as some countries are now coming out of lockdown. Um, I was hearing about, we had people on it from Hong Kong who were saying particularly that, that there's now an, an air route opened up between Hong Kong and Singapore with daily flights and they're seeing a surge in demand from that, particularly leisure demand. So I think the key thing is going to be working out which markets are going to bounce back first. Uh, and I know that our, our, the hotels we, we, we work with in the Gulf um, have seen people, again, people traveling an hour, two hours just to be somewhere different um, and, and to experience being away from home for a couple of days. Um, so it's been a short break market. It's been short travel market. Um, and I think that will be the first market to bounce back. The further you travel, the harder it is going to be to get back to it because airlines aren't opening and until, until they do and it's safe to travel, people aren't going to do it. But every, everything I've seen has said that there is demand, there is people still want experiences. As Tom was saying, we're an experiential economy these days and uh, that's what people want, are going to want to do. Um, it is going to be different. Safety is going to be the new rock and roll. It's going to be what people are buying more than anything, both in terms of how you get through airports, how you travel inside a country and what you experience whilst you're there. So putting forward a post COVID agenda is, is going to be critical for destinations, but um, there's demand and there will be demand. There's, as, as Tom says, there's, there's many people who've prepaid and uh, have things in the pipeline when they're able to exercise them. Um, so I think, that, ma that market, that local market is going to be the first to open and then people repeat visiting places they've been to and liked before because they have confidence in it. But more and more people are going to be um, stepping out into adventures. I think the last market to open up is going to be the corporate markets. I think meetings and events are, well, we, 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 we ran a webinar recently and uh, one of our panelists on it uh, was the guy who is responsible for meetings and events for um, BP and uh, he has an enormous budget and he was saying they're not even thinking about international meetings before Q3 next year at the very earliest and I think uh, you know with the concerns that businesses have about corporate manslaughter and health and welfare of their travellers they are really going to be reticent to and it will be essential business travel only and meetings and events will be on platforms like this for as, as far as we can reasonably see in the future. So I think that, that there will be a progression of markets. This is what we're seeing, starting with regional markets and then getting in, or local markets, then getting into regional markets and, and, and international markets opening up longer. But um, the demand in each of them is going to be led by people visiting areas where they've been before and they're comfortable go, to go back to. That's, you know, it's an evolving picture, but that's what I'm seeing at the moment. Thank you very much, Peter. And of course, you're, you're very much on the coal face with all the um, different hospitality um, members of the Institute. Um, Simon, uh, from an airline perspective, um, and you, you're covering UK and Ireland, and of course, with um, we will come on to Brexit a little later on, but um, you can't talk about the UK and Ireland right now without um, thinking of Brexit or EU exit, as we're, we're now naming it. Um, how, how does the picture look for you? So uh, I think I'd, I'd, I'd agree with Tom and Peter there. I mean, from an airline side, demand is massively depressed. So we, we just published our September data and we're seeing demand down uh, in September, 82.5%. And that was a decline on uh, August, <laughs> which was actually a better month, which might tie into the, to the point about uh, Peter was making about leisure travel. But actually what's driving that 
continuing reduction is Europe in particular locking down again. We're all sat in our front rooms because the UK is on a is on a month long lockdown. So so the problem here is is twofold is is quarantine. That's what we see as a massive, massive barrier to travel, um, because as Peter said, there is latent demand. Um, so to give you one just small example of that, when the Canaries, which uh, came off the UK's no go list, was uh, just came off from one day to the next, we saw an increase through our systems of, of over 100 percent, 112 percent increase overnight in people booking travel to go to the Canaries because it coincided with half term in the UK. So the kids were on holiday, off they went. That demand is absolutely there. I think on the corporate travel, it, it is a fair point. But however, I, I, I think there is latent demand there. I mean, we're all business people. We are fed up to the back teeth of sitting in our front rooms, not meeting people face to face. I think the pressure will be on corporate budgets more than anything else, because every business is facing a very difficult time. And, and corporate travel budgets are something that, that uh, will be squeezed. Um, but I think there is absolutely latent demand out there. If we can somehow overcome quarantine, and maybe we'll come on to that, but that's something that we're working on to try and really find a way around that because a mandatory 14 day quarantine, which many countries have, is simply a complete barrier to any any form of travel and in particular corporate travel, I think. Thank you, Simon. And in fact, we may as well, while you've raised it, go straight back into um, quarantine and um, testing for testing pre and um, either testing on departure, testing on arrival, um, whether it should be PCR, rapid testing, there's a whole, a whole bunch of opportunities or solutions out there that are being practiced um, around the globe. And, and clearly what is really needed is a, a protocol, um, whether it's a regional or global protocol, because right now the consumer must be um, very confused. It keeps changing. Um, I know when we had the corridor in the UK, um, the government said, well, you come back and not quarantine from these countries. But what they didn't take into account was the fact you couldn't physically go to those countries because they had closed their borders. And there are many countries in that position at this moment in time. So do you want to pick that one up again, Simon? Yes, I mean, I think, you know, the uh, the uh, data that we're seeing in IR was definitely that uh, quarantine is a problem. And I think the point that, that, that you made is right, Alison, it's not only is there imposing quarantine, it's chopping and changing very rapidly. There's no certainty for uh, travellers. So what uh, what we're trying to push in IATA is a is a is a commonly agreed and harmonised testing regime, ideally globally. Now, that is very difficult to achieve, but we're trying to do that through ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, um, but also at a regional level. Um, and what, what we would like to see is a single test on departure and zero quarantine using rapid testing, uh, uh, you know, there's various different types you say, but the antigen testing, which is becoming more and more accepted actually um, in a risk framework. We have a situation here in the UK where government is rolling out rapid antigen testing to allow travel of students, for example, to come home for the uh, festive period. Uh, so they're trusting antigen testing for people to move. So uh, and as we see it, that's a solution that is low cost, rapid and will enable travel. But more importantly, it will allow people to travel with confidence and be countries to be confident that they're not allowing people into the country uh, that would add to the to the to the uh, pandemic in that country. And I think we've we have also reached a point where governments are pursuing zero risk. Life is not zero risk, sadly, and people would not step on an aeroplane if government regulators chose zero risk. It has to, we have to find a balance somehow between managing the risk of an outbreak um, and allowing travel. And no, uh, very few countries have pursued a virus elimination strategy. Yes, some have, New Zealand, Australia, but very few have. Across all of Europe, the virus was, was prevalent across the summer. So there is an acceptance that uh, it's going to be always there. So we just need to find a way to manage it and work with it. Um, thank you, Simon. And how, how would that be managed and um, worked with within the hospitality um, industry, Peter? Um, well, I, I think testing is good. You know, we're used now every time we walk into a restaurant or a hotel to having our, our temperature taken in one way or another. But it goes beyond that. And I, and I think there has to be a, a seamless testing process where people I don't know people are given wristbands or what they're given to show they had a test but uh, there has to be some sort of um, COVID free passport that people are, are, are traveling with because hotels are going to want to be as sure about that as governments are and as airlines are um, but I think 
well, we, we are, you know, we're, we're all symbiotic, aren't we? we're all part of the same process. And until the airlines are flying, hotels are not going to get busy. Um, there's, there's going to be a gradual, gradual ramping up. Thank you. And thank you. And Tom, um, from a tour operator's point of view, um, you know, how would how would you envisage this being managed? Because obviously um, testing airports, departure, arrival, etc. Um, this does put an onus on the on the travel industry as a whole. Discussion concerning um, testing um, really um, is a huge suppression of demand. It leads to a huge suppression of demand. And I think that, to be entirely frank with you, until we get uh, a wide acceptance and a wide distribution of the vaccine, until COVID frankly stops being a story, we're going to see um, a situation where we're very lucky to see 50% of normal business. Um, I think what we're hoping for is a general ramping down of the um, current requirements in terms of quarantine um, in early next year and that we return to something like what was witnessed in Europe in, in August. We we're hoping for something like that in March, April, May, June of next year. That will lead to some traffic. Um, the, <coughs> the people from what we can see is that the people who are most insistent on taking their vacation are the people who um, have almost a kind of genetic requirement to go off and have a beach holiday somewhere hot. This is um, a, you know, a drive that people have that they feel they're entitled to and will have if they can. And I think this is a lot of what we, we were hearing from Simon about the Canary Islands. We were witnessing to a certain extent uh, concerning Spain and Greece in the summer, uh, summer of 2020. Um, what what is intriguing from our point of view is almost the sort of gray area, as I said, between February and June, July of next year. We're hoping that by August, the vaccines and various other procedures will basically allow COVID to drop off being an issue. Uh, but prior to that, I think there's real scope and real interest for um, people to come and enjoy Europe in a way which Europe is ne has never been available like this before and nor will ever be available like it will be in, in the future. I think you've got an exceptionally empty London, an exceptionally empty uh, Venice, Florence, Rome, an exceptionally empty Paris and the prices which will never be repeated again. So the experience that people can have um, in the first half of next year will be unique um, and I think that will generate generate some business. I also question, I mean, we've all got different models and I, no one knows which one is right, but it's intriguing that, um, you know, there is still, there's been a considerable reduction in airlift from North America into Europe and indeed from Australia into Europe. What's interesting is that the um, flag carrying airlines coming from the Gulf, particularly those from the Gulf, have maintained their schedules. And they are offering amazing deals for people coming in via, either from the Gulf or via the Gulf into, into Europe. And uh, it's possible the moment um, restrictions will get lifted, that there's a huge surge of delivery in that area because people can deliver product very quickly now in those areas and they can pick them up very quickly. The only restraint will be visas. That's my only point. Well, let's stay with that for a minute, Tom, and the um, the visas and 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 um, Brexit. Maybe if that would affect any any um, aspect of the visas, are there any discussions on the table at the moment about the UK joining a a European visa? We weren't part of it when we were in Europe. Is there a possibility we could become part of it once we're out of Europe? Um, what is the visa situation for? possibly from the Gulf um, into Europe and then the UK? I, I mean, the, the, the short answer is, is that um, uh, there's going to be huge pressure on the British government to rewrite the way in which they look at visas, partly because they, they've got to do something about their incoming tourism industry in the UK. Um, it's in tatters. It's not on, on a basis where it can recover in the same way that the, the rest of Europe can recover. One of the interesting things that occurred uh, the summer of 2020 was the extent to which Schengen a lot of people are very critical of it, but 
largely it worked. Um, what people saw as a domestic tourism recovery actually occurred throughout Europe. Um, you had Germans going to the Netherlands, you had Germans going down to um, Italy and into, into Spain in a way in which in the UK you only saw people uh, going from Birmingham down to Cornwall. Uh, and it meant that the, the market in the UK is now dr is dramatically reduced as we're not part of the Schengen area. I think the likelihood of us joining the Schengen area in the near future is nil. Uh, I can comfortably point that. It's possible, only because I keep asking for it, is that people in possession of Schengen visas should, could be offered visa waivers. This is something I've been asking for for many years, and it's possible that that might occur. But if you're looking for a sudden new Brexit dawn of uh, welcoming foreigners in with open arms, uh, no. Um, the UK is resplendent in having the most bureaucratic and complicated visa system on earth. So Simon, um, going on to um, Brexit, EU exit, are you seeing any um, patterns at all with the airlines at the moment? I know it's difficult to see any patterns with COVID as well, but is that is that having effect at all on traffic um, around the I mean, I mean, I don't think I don't think it's having having any effect. I mean, there were there was uh, there was uh, some effect last time round that we approached this, but we were of course operating in a, in a normal environment, and of course, COVID overshadows all of that in terms of how uh, airlines are planning and indeed how people can and can't travel. Uh, uh, having said that, you know, the EU exit, as you rightly said, we're, which is what we're calling it now here in the UK, it does present. Does, we do come to an end of the so-called transition period at the end of this year, so we'll no longer be subject to European uh, laws and regulations. And obviously from an aviation side, um, not just in terms of traffic rights, but in terms of the way the business is regulated for safety and operations and stuff, that's very much done at the European level. So we do need an agreement between the UK and the EU on aviation matters and those negotiations continue and actually on aviation matters our understanding we're not party to those conversations but our understanding is that those negotiations on aviation are going well um, there are of course some sticking points the, the the bigger issues are on things not related to travel fishing and others which there is no agreement which is blocking the overall agreement so you know our hope is we still have some agreement which allows uh, the con continuation of travel which i'm sure it will by the way there will be no grounding of flights in fact both sides have said very clearly that is not going to happen it didn't happen last time there was a bridging agreement last time it's in nobody's interest to have a situation where booked schedules can't be honored so uh, both sides have said that they would implement a, a bridging arrangement um, if it came to it for aviation. So I think I'm reasonably confident there is not going to be, you know, the end of the world scenario that you might read in some newspapers sometimes. Thank you. And, and Peter, um, from a, a Brexit point of view, um, I know that the hospitality industry um, 12 months ago was suffering quite a lot from a loss of um, potentially a loss of employment. Um, EU nationals returning home, um, not necessarily coming over um, in the summer this year. Obviously, COVID has, has put a whole completely different light on that at the moment as to how many employees are required in the industry. But looking forward um, to next year, and uh, do you feel that um, Brexit will have an impact on, on the employment of European nationals in our industry? To, to a degree it will, and uh, I think that the, the rules that we've currently got imposed in terms of people's eligibility, in terms of the salaries they're paid, etc., make it quite difficult for certain entry-level roles in hospitality. But um, I, I would, I would I, I, you've got to think about it in a slightly different way. Um, I, I sit on an advisory board that is a European-wide advisory board, and everybody prior to March this year the top main, the main thing we spoke about whenever we met was about the shortage of people under the age of 25. And that's a key, key group for hospitality. You know, that young people come in as waiters, they come in and do, you know, do jobs like that when they're studying, etc. cetera. Um, every country in, in Western Europe was saying there is a vast, a massive decline of people in that age group wanting to come into hospitality because they all want to work in the ga in gaming industry, in, in gaming and in, uh, in, in the sexy industries rather than doing what uh, traditionally they've done. 
So it's not a Brexit issue solely. It's, it's a, um, an issue that we have to reposition the industry as, as being an exciting career of choice or, or job of choice for people before they start their main careers. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, it's not going to help Brexit. Bre Brexit it, it doesn't do a lot of good for the industry. No, obviously not. And um, I know that we're going to be r uh, wrapping up shortly. So um, I'm just going to go round the panel one more time. If you've got a, a specific message that you would like to impart on the on the golf market in particular um, and, and, and global market um, for their for, for them to think about um, sending business to Europe and think about sending business into the UK as well. Um, and, and where they can find information. So if you can just also mention your websites as you go around, because all three websites are an absolute a fund of information for, for anybody looking um, to travel anywhere in the world. So um, I'm going to start with you, Simon, if you'd just like to add any extra comments and then just let everybody know what I asked as um, uh, website is thank you yeah sure I mean I think I think uh, it's, it's, it's been a very interesting conversation I think for us the key thing is to have a harmonized approach among states to get rid of quarantine however we do that um, and I think there is one specific thing which is interesting the UK has a travel corridor policy which is where it allows free travel without any testing or quarantine or anything um, however it doesn't allow for transit um, via countries not on the safe list. And this is very important for the Gulf states, because as we all know, many of the Gulf states are very, very big transit hubs now for flows of passengers. Um, and, and for many of those countries, they weren't able to allow transits through those countries because they would have still had to quarantine when they arrived. And that's something we're saying is that when you look at the the lengths that some of these countries are going to in their hub airports to ensure the safety of passengers, it seems extraordinary that the UK government doesn't recognise that. So that's something very specific for the Gulf that we're pushing here with the UK government. Um, in terms of our website, it's uh, iarta.org, but we do have quite, a, we have two interesting sections there. One is, one is a section for what we call air transport professionals. So really that's anybody in the travel industry, which shows the status of all the various different policy measures. But we also have, and I'm sure many will have seen it, an interactive travel map that is updated daily, in fact hourly, that shows all of the restrictions in place globally. So you can click on the country you want to go to and it shows you precisely what you can and can't do, when you can go, uh, what the restrictions are related to COVID, should I say, as well as the usual old, what we used to talk about, which was visas and so on. So that's the summary from me, Alison. Thank you very much, Simon. And yes, that is a very useful tool to, uh, to note down. Um, Peter? Well, I, I, I think that the, uh, the, the, key, the key message, I think, for, for hospitality is as businesses reopen and as, as markets reopen, that the, the businesses that succeed are going to be A, those that truly represent themselves as being safe places to stay and safe destinations to travel to, but, all, but also those who are innovative and quick on their toes in terms of their marketing and their engagement with the market. I, th I think that's going to be what absolutely drives it because that's what we've seen already um, in, in those pockets of time when, when things have opened up. Um, that's where the winners and losers have been. So that's really my, my key message. Our website is um, instituteofhospitality.org, O-R-G. Thank you. And um, Tom? Um, yeah, I well, thank you. I mean, um, my website, for what it's worth while I remember it, is... Uh, to do this is etoa.org. It's not complicated. I think um, just to touch, I don't think um, there is much to fear about next year. I think um, there may be a problem, uh, which hasn't been mentioned yet, concerning Brexit, which is if you're leaving the UK as a non-EU citizen and trying to, enter in, and trying to enter Europe, it looks like that process may be rather complicated. So if you're thinking of going into the UK and then traveling on to France, for example, um, there may be quite a long queue at the non-EU um, uh, immigration desk because all the Brits will have to join that immigration desk. And if you're traveling from the Gulf, you will be there with the British. The British have brought it on themselves, so I wouldn't feel any sorry for them, but uh, you may find yourself in a very, very long queue to get through. I pray that they sort this problem out at the moment it's right in the middle of my agenda. Um, I think next year, um, if we've 
said goodbye to quarantine, if there are air bridges open and people can travel, um, I think it's going to be a, a fantastic time to be in the UK and in Europe. I think um, the place will be comparatively empty, the prices will be comparatively low, and I think you will be thoroughly welcome everywhere you go because tourists are going to be rarer than hen's tea. And I think um, it's just going to be a fantastic time to be an intermediary selling a brilliant product to a keen audience. And what a great time to be a travel agent in the Gulf. So I would be really optimistic about your prospects over the next 12 months. It's going to be infinitely better than 2020. Thank you very much, Tom. And um, for those of you who are looking to contact the European tour operators, uh, tourist boards, sorry, not tour operators, tourist boards, um, one of uh, the organizations that I run is called Antor, A-N-T-O-R. And Antor.com um, has the list and contact details of all the different um, European tourist boards. So you can find out more information from them as well as from the other websites that we've just mentioned. Um, so thank you all very much. I'd like to thank the panel for their time and their insights. And I'd also like to thank Sanjeet for inviting us to be part of this, um, this very exciting new show. And hand back to you, Sanjeet. Thank you. Thank you very much. In fact, I want to say thank you to all, all four of you. Uh, this was quite enlightening. It was quite, uh, quite eye-opening. I, I love the concepts you're playing with. And uh, I'm sure everyone over there in the Middle East is going to look forward to this and uh, going to hear each one of you what you have said. Thank you all so much. What happens to the source markets? Do you think the new, there'll be new source markets or will the same ones exist? Like, uh, like what uh, Sabin said about the canary. What things change in the future? That, sorry, this is just something which we're all debating in the Middle East over here. Where will they travel to? Where will the business come from in the future? Hmm. Do you want to kick off with this? Um, I, think, um, I think when things come back, uh, it, will remarkably, it will start looking remarkably like it did in 2018, 2019. I think the money is still where it is. Uh, the um, international relations will be where they are in 2018, which means the visa situation will be as it is. Uh, people's taste might be sharper, but it'll be remarkably the same. Uh, if you go and talk to someone in North America or even in the Gulf, you ask them where they want to go in Europe, they'll go, well, we want to go to London, we want to go to Paris. I've heard of Rome, I'll go there. Let's go to Venice, it sounds cute. Uh, Florence is famous, let's do that. I'll see the Alps. It's going to be very much the same sort of bucket list you're p pitching to. So I don't think um, I, and I'm uh, sometimes an outlier on this. I don't think we're going to see much change. We'll see growth coming back. Um, but I don't think, unless the current crisis has fundamentally altered the economic balance of the world, and I don't think it has, um, I think we will see demand coming back. And I, I, I'm determinedly optimistic. I think it will, will come back quite strongly. I say determinedly optimistic in the full knowledge that there is no more stupid optimism than a determined optimist. So, um, uh, but uh, I suppose that's what I'm paid to do. Thank you, Sam. Peter? Yeah, I, well, I, I agree entirely. I think the markets that are gonna come back are those that people are gonna keep people, I believe people are gonna want to go, A, to where they can easily get to, so where there's good air routes and good, good air cover, and also where they feel safe and you, you feel safe where you've been before so i think i think the the, the hardcore new destinations are going to find it harder than uh, than the established mainstream destination not least because they've got all the infrastructure in place and the infrastructure you know it, infrastructure is what drives tourism surely so uh, yeah simon well from an airline perspective i mean air, airline network planners uh, normally use a nice history of travel that they know gets repeated year after year and, and i think if you talk to any network planner now they don't know what that future demand is i think tom's right i don't think it has changed but airlines will experiment with markets and i think the difference you'll see is that from an airline perspective is that if there is not enough demand they will switch off those routes because they cannot afford 
to sustain loss making routes like they used to be able to do and the hope that that you know if you start a new route as an airline it takes some time to rebuild it up but now if there's not the demand the route will be cut overnight and we see we saw that last summer we saw airlines going on fishing expeditions on routes and very very you know short notice cancellations simply because they know they wouldn't make money on it and you only have to look at the balance sheets of airlines they they, they can't muck around they've got to find routes where they can make money now their business is at the end of the day so i think that's the only slight nuance i would say that might drive a bit of a change to where there is demand the airlines might not service it if there's not enough demand I'd also add to that that a lot of research and um, behu uh, consumer behaviour research um, recently has shown that there is a tendency towards people looking for nature and um, uh, revisiting actually their, their motivations for travelling. So that could in fact um, not necessarily affect the destinations that they travel to, but perhaps where they stay, um, what they decide to do when they're there, um, and, and also there's obviously the, the are we going for hotel accommodation or Airbnb type accommodation, which is affecting the statistics as well. So I feel that there will be a change in consumer behavior, perhaps more than in destination choice. Thank you. Thank you so much. In fact, that means I want to tell the travel fraternity at the moment, this uh, so-called new source markets they're looking at is temporary. And after that is really going to go back. So they should just hold on to their, uh, their itineraries, their relationships for future. So this is going to bounce back sooner than later. Mm -hmm.